Okay, guys. So, as I say up here, you know, I kind of left it on seminars and whatnot. I believe that it's better to to teach through real life experiences and stories and see how people learn and understand things out there. And so this is a little bit of my story. Don't mean it to be about me per se, but it's what can happen, what you got to go through, and how you have to navigate issues because they will become issues and will be forthcoming for all of us one more time. So we call this just the Big Bang. This is a fairly quick improvised PowerPoint, so we'll just run through it. I guess you got to point it. Helps to the right direction. So, in 1985, who was in business in 85? A couple of us were, not a whole lot. What happened in 85? So, there was the crash, right? And it started this with the SNL issues. And then, in about 96, the government came in, they changed the tax laws. It went from what was a four to one tax write off for real estate to a one to one write off. And it absolutely cratered the entire marketplace. Now, I was a young lawyer at this time. I went out of law school about a year or two. And I didn't know sneezing from Sinola at this point and didn't really recognize what was going on. Now, of course, hindsight teaches you a lot. And then, of course, once they did the tax law changes, they brought in this thing called the RTC, the Resolution Trust Company which gathered all the properties into a big pool and pulled them out in some format. And during this time, of course, you know, everybody understands our market downturns all the time. But as we were talking earlier about, you know, everybody wants to have a good time roll, right? Everybody thinks it will never end, and it just keeps on going. And no one wants to believe it. It's just, it's your attitude. If you're in the investing marketplace, you have to be optimistic to move forward. And you never think that things are going to happen. I'm a little goofy sometimes, so what's the song with Beverly Hillbillies? Y'all sing, come on. Yeah, really <laughs> <laughs> no. So this isn't about Jed, but it's about me a little bit, okay? So, um, so August 2008, I had about 700 loans in portfolio. So I'll do the math in your head. If you have about an average of $100,000 property, what that adds up to. And guys, this is me. This is not some big conglomeration. And it makes you pucker a little bit. We were out rocking and rolling. We were doing 30 to 40 million a year in asset-based lending, which was pretty good at that point. We were one of the two largest asset-based lenders in Texas. There was no end. Guys, we're at 18%, two points. It was awesome. So today in the asset-based world, you know, it's around 12 and 2, 12 and 3, it seems to be the average out there to some regard. And literally, you get blinded by success. It will never end. And then the Big Bang. So what happened in August 08? Anybody remember? What was the first one that went down? Washington Mutual. I was sitting in my den watching TV. At 10.30, and on Fox News, is the first time they announced the closure of WAMU. And so when, when WAMU closed, then came IndyMac, big bank out of California. If you guys really want to understand how the feds work and how the uh, um, FDIC works, go to YouTube, and this will scare you to death, and, and look at the story of IndyMac. It, it's really fascinating, and it will teach you a lot about the things that went on. Who saw the movie The Big Short? I'm just telling you, that was that movie takes you through the real estate crash uh, in 08, 09, 10, and what was going on in, in reality. So, of course, Wamu was first, then IndyMac, and then I'm not sure how many other thousands of banks failed, but the rest followed. At that time, guys, I was carrying about $50 million in lines of credit. I had about $10 million of private capital. Literally, within 30 days of WAMU being announced being shut down, every banking line of credit shut off, mm. and you're done. Think about that. 30 days after that, every homeowner lost the ability to buy a home. The investors lost the ability to get out. 
the bottom line is, I mean, it's a total shutdown. What do you do? Do you all want to be in that position? I didn't. And so, you know, you go through a thought process. You think you're safe, right? So in the hard money lending world, you do 70% loan values based on appraisal. Great. We had our loans spread out over 600 plus clients probably. We had one client that had two or three deals out there, those kind of items. And you're, you're those spread out. But guys, we weren't. You think you are. So we go out there, and of course, when the banks shut down, they're looking for solutions. They really don't want to foreclose on your properties and what was kind of things. What was going on, though, at this time, um, as we were taking houses back wholesale, and as I note up here, we took back about 130 homes in a very, very short time frame. And again, do the math on 130 homes, what that volume is, non-income producing, how do you service that debt? So we would get houses back primarily from investors, not homeowners. And we'll all keep that in mind. But the investor marketplace at that time was offering you 40 cents of the dollar. It wasn't cutting you off at the knees. It was cutting us off at the hips. So if you have a property that had an appraisal of $100,000, you owe your bank $70,000, they're offering you 40. Who wants to take that offer? None of us do. You can't do it, right? And... As you go through this, as we went through this, you know, these houses started just defaulting. And of course, you're trying to reach people. They're not returning phone calls. So you have to go out and you have to find properties. And if this wasn't in my backyard at Dallas or Fort Worth, this is in Waco, Austin, San Antonio, Corpus, the Valley, Tyler, Amarillo. Um, and you can't fly there. A, you got no money. You're driving there. And when you get there, you have to investigate these houses one by one. I can't imagine going to Little Rock, you know, for instance, from Dallas. I know nothing about Little Rock. And you get a house back, and it's like, what do you do? You got to start all over again, right? You have to learn new marketplaces. What's going on in that particular market? What, what are my options? You have to find contractors. Because getting houses back, guess what? They've been stripped because the investor just walked away. Your AC is gone. Wiring is gone. Things of that nature. You have to learn how to how, what do you about financing deposits. What do you do? What, I mean, again, what do you do? When you've never been there before, you don't know how to handle it. So what do you do? So I'm just going to tell you all real quick, this is just my story. When that happens, you get, you're scared to death. Who knows where Potsboro is? A few of you. <laughs> Potsboro's on Lake Texoma, by the way. And we had a small lake house up there. And I literally told my wife, it's like, guys, we're out of here. We're moving to the lake house. We're going to file bankruptcy, get out of this thing. The kids are going to go to Pop Barrow schools with my wife's going ballistic life. You know, you don't know what to do. And when I say you better learn how to drop to your knees, you better learn how to do that because it scares the heck out of you. So first, you go through this. At this time, I had 22 different banks online. And so I went out and I met with every banker one-on-one. -on -one. And those aren't fun conversations. What do your bankers want? They want money, right? They don't care about it. As we mentioned earlier, you know, when the Fed was sitting inside the banks, they don't care. you got to put together a plan. But remember, bankers are just that. They're bankers. They're not investors. Some think they are, but they're not. And bankers are really looking for solutions. They want to figure out how to do things. They really don't want to own properties. Now, I will tell you, there were some banks out there that didn't care. Of course, in hindsight, you learn why they didn't care. You know, Provident Bank was a bank over in Fort Worth that we had picked up a $2 million line of credit with, paid them a one point fee up front, and we have a contractual obligation where they have to lend me $2 million at the price of percent of the documents. We did four deals and they cut us off. Cut my money. It took a year and a half to get it back. Could you sue the bank? You could, but how long would that take? How much money would it take? You don't want to do it. But things happen. Then, of course, you learn what's going on. Well, the feds are there telling them you all have problems. Compass Bank. I just saw uh, something online. There was a $98 million settlement uh, with an investor who had properties. Compass was telling them, we're going to renew your loans. We're going to renew your loans. We're going to renew your loans. Oops, sorry, we're foreclosing on you. They did the same thing to me. I had a $5 million line with Compass. We were paying things off. 
and they were bought by um who were they bought by um big spanish tank bottom bb the bbva bottom yeah and so anyway they transfer everything down to brownfield for servicing and then they sold off my debt they took my notes sold them to an investor out of florida what did that investor want to do what do y'all think what were they in business to do? Do you think they're in business to collect the monthly payment? Sure. They want the asset. So they want to get the asset back. They bought it for, you know, they took my my 70% debt. They probably bought it for 40 cents. And they wanted to get and reach that profit. That's their goal. So what do they do? They post everything for foreclosure. What do you do at that point? Because banks aren't lending you money. What would y'all do? Pardon me? Well, you could, but does anybody here want to file bankruptcy? I don't know of anybody that really wants to do that. You have to find private capital sources and other scenarios. But again, remember, you can't sell the house to the open market because your investor got you $40,000, you owe seventy. dollars You can't find a homeowner because they can't get a loan. So you have to go out and find private capital. First National Bank Southwest. Same thing I found out from the buddy of mine in Fort Worth. They were selling off my debt to somebody because he was getting on it. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I mean, you're going nuts as you go through this. Bank of America. And they went through some processes with us. And of course, when the uh, we were in a lawsuit with B of A on a, on a deal, y'all remember when um, the B of A bought the servicer out of California? Who they bought? Countrywide. And the government announced they were suing Countrywide for billions for all these improper practices. At 8 a.m. the next morning after that announcement, I get a phone call from Strasburger and Price. We want to sell. They sell it for nothing and walked away. But it took a year because no one at the bank cared. Well, that was B of A. These smaller banks, they all had things going on. Companies got bought out by BBVA. Different powers came to be. The smaller banks, they had the feds inside directing traffic. And when they say jump, as I said earlier, it's how, like how high. You don't have an option. So lessons you kind of go through in this. First off, never put your eggs in one basket, right? Everybody's heard that? Uh, back in 1998, I don't remember this gentleman's name. He was in our business um, buying houses. And he had had three or four banks. And they all got shut down in, in the crash at that point in time. He was out of business. And his, his comment was, do not use this one bank. Spread it out to everything. And again, we had at that time 22 different banks. That was a pain in the rear, but we spread it out. Does anybody know who uh, Foothill Capital is? For Textron? Y'all heard of Textron? Dell Helicopter? How about that? Foothill Capital is the division of Wells Fargo. It's their private lending section. And of course, through Textron, and they were all out trying to do loans. And they had come to us wanting us to consolidate all of our lending in one place. They were offering us what's called a LIBOR rate, which would have cut my interest rates by about one and a half percent. And when you have, you know, tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars, it adds up, right? It was extremely attractive to do that. You know, having your money in one place, not 22 banks. You're getting all this extra money. For some reason, my partner and I would said, we just can't do that. You know, they've got too much control, too much this, and we were smart enough to pull back on that. There was a company down in Houston called Tread, the Texas Real Estate Development. They were a home investor franchisee, good guys, and they were you no know, rock and roll. They were investors, they were lenders, etc. Well, they went with a tax fund. Got a good deal, but when the crash hit, what happened? They called them. The entire portfolio, about 50 million, called. Debt was transferred to Texas Capital, and they were out of business. They had no option. From my end, with 22 banks, I was able to go in, meet with each bank individually, one on one. And as I said earlier, banks don't want to own the properties, right? They're looking for solutions. So I was able to renegotiate a short term. You know, one year type notes for our asset based lending for the long term to find a way to get the properties paid off. So, again, as we're doing business, you have to have access to capital. I don't care who you are, 
Small business business need access to capital, whether it's private capital, institutional capital, playing the creative cash flow game in some format, one or the other, through our, through our business. But do not just put your eggs in one basket. Always diversify to protect yourself. Learn to build relationships. As we went through with our banks in this instance, you know, we built friendships with all our bankers. We made it a habit. It was full disclosure. Let's go play golf. I wanted them to understand our business and how we did things internally. And it gave them a confidence level. Because when the time came, we had to go back in and do it, you need an advocate. If the feds are sitting in the back office directing traffic and they have to go present this to the feds, what do they say? If you've got a bad track record, you've got bad history, you don't pay well, you do this well, they're going to say, no, kill it, cut it off, and go, right? That's what Tim kind of talked about for a moment on his side. But when you have that relationship, it gives you at least an advocate to do that with. Get revenue to investors. Investors are great sounding boards because sometimes you get great ideas from other people out there in a way to look at a transaction differently. You know, you want to create exit strategies, and maybe they have some for you. Maybe they can buy your property if need be. Do the right thing. We don't see a lot of that, unfortunately, today. You know, as I noted, I could have run for the hills, right? When you're getting that position and you know, the banks are trying to sue you, this is going on, that's going on, you, you don't know what to do. But if you've done the right thing, you can do it. Now, I chose to stay and do it, and it cost me millions, literally, to, to, to save off everything and to put it back together again. At the end of the day, it was probably the best choice I could make. I don't want to ever go through this again. I mean, it was a nightmare for years. I spent, I don't travel. I don't like to travel per se for business. And um, I was gone four days of the week, every week, for four and a half years. I had to put, I, put, I think I put 250,000 miles in my car traveling, putting everything back together again. And your option was file bankruptcy or find a solution to the problem and make it happen. Most people aren't willing to go to that link, but it was the best thing that I could have done. And again, you know, the integrity issue, guys. In our business, I see so much limited integrity. It's all about the bottom line, money today. I don't care what happens to anybody else out there. Build your integrity. Build your character. And again, it translates in your business with your banks, other investors as well. And that will help you in the long run. Watch market trends. You have to be aware. You can't just walk around with blinders on. And again, we all do that. We're, we're all optimistic. We're all investors. You know, the, the world is never going to end. Things are going to go. And it can go plus the gallon in New York says the world's going to end in 12 years. Have yeah. you all heard that? Yeah. Uh, no. So be aware of it. Watch the trend, as we were talking about earlier. What's going on with the market? You know, markets, they go up, they pop down, they kind of stabilize a little bit. Here in Texas, at least in DFW, Unlike California, New York, and other places like this, we don't get these huge swings in value. It's a very slow, gradual increase, you know, 2 or 3% annually at most. And it's re recognize those kind of items. Watch what is happening. Like, on, on, look at your sale comps and analyze it. Look for trends. What's going on? Uh, are days in the market increasing or decreasing? You know, if you know that things are slowing down a little bit, maybe when you're a value at home, Take a few percent off of that value for your calculation purposes. Don't just assume everything's going to keep going up, up, up. You have to be smart in how you do that. Watch out for overbuilt areas. You know, things of this nature that are going on. Uh, and the overinflated values. Again, too many people, at least here in DFW, I know we have some Arkansas crowd here, et cetera. I don't know what's going on in Arkansas. But I see too, too, too many people paying too much for property. And guys, the only way you can, once you do that, the only way you can actually recover from that is long-term hold. There's no other option. You have to find a way for long-term hold and pay off your debt. And you can't sell it because you're going to be stuck. And if that's, if that's your business model, that's fine. But just ensure you're able to get that debt reduced because if you're using banking capital, if you're using cash, that's great. How many people in this room have huge piles of cash to buy asset with? Because if you do, I want to know you. I don't see that out there. So we're all borrowing money somewhere. And you've got to be smart enough to reduce that debt in some format to stabilize. Don't be greedy, as we talked about earlier. 
Um, and by the guys, I'm the worst one at this. I'm that eternal optimist, and I want to keep growing and keep going. The difference is, and what I do, I see some other people do out there, is we pay off our debt as fast as possible. This is our real estate. I buy houses today with institutional capital, but my loan to values are 64%. That's pretty good. It's not 80%, right? I borrow second lien capital in order to offset. So sometimes I have no cash in the deal because I keep my cash back for reserve so I can see making my payments along the way. But on my second lien capital, it's not 15-year money. It's 18-month money. It's 24, it's 36. That means I'm making zero dollars on my asset while I'm holding it. And so as you go through this, you have to anticipate it and you don't have to control the world. No, I, I, I want to be world dominant in the real estate investment business. That's just my mentality. And I have to pull myself back from that brink constantly. So just, again, being smart as we go through this. Exit strategies. How many in the room have multiple exit strategies? So I see most investors, their thought process stops at the end of the nose. Too often that happens. They, they buy a home, and they get a house under contract, and they don't really know what the back-end exit strategy is going to be until they've already bought the house. But sometimes that's too late. You want to plan in advance to know what it is. But what if you buy a home, and your exit strategy is retail? And that's it. And what if you can't sell the property? What are you going to do? What are you going to tell your private investor to put the money up to do that? Or what are you going to tell your bank you can't sell? Or whatever it might be. You have to have other options. It may be you have to wholesale the property. I see y'all know that is, which is a cross between the wholesale and retail marketplace in some format. Maybe you have rental investors who buy. What do rental investors buy houses on? What, what percentage, y'all know? Right now, it's probably about 80, I'd say, in, in the DFW area. So they're not paying you 100 cents in the dollar. There might be somebody that does that. You might find someone with an IRA that's supposed to make a, a, a return on investment. Uh, but normally, they're not going to pay you 100%. So when I walk into a deal, I'm always looking for at least three ways out of every deal I've got, whatever it might be. My current uh, option and has been historically is a seller financing. So there's always going to be someone there to buy the home if you offer the financing. Even in the subprime days when you could fog a mirror and get a loan, we were able to sell our, our, our properties with financing. Not as attractive as it is today, but you can do that. And as you go through this with your exit strategies, if you don't have them, create them. But you have to have short-term solutions to your problem out there. You have to have long-term options in our business. You have to have cash reserves. And I see too many investors who have zero. They've all bought into the guru packages that you're going to get rich quick in real estate, and that's not real life, and we've all seen that out there. You know, you have to develop cash flow. What runs our businesses, guys, is cash flow. It is not equity. It is not the ability to buy and sell and get out of the deal and get X dollars. It is cash flow. Work yourself towards the development of cash flow. When the crash hit for us, we had Many, 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 many homes that were debt-free. It was cash flow. I had enough room between my houses and my uh, what people owed me when I owed our bank that I only had positive cash flow in some regard. And then I said earlier, I think one of the smartest things you have to do is learn to reduce your debt quickly. Now, again, that's the part where too many investors are too greedy and want cash today, not tomorrow. <laughs> So what was my solution to all this mess, okay? Let me ask this question. What would y'all do? You, you just took back 130 houses. You owe your bank 13 million of non-income producing property. What do you do? You have vacant houses coming in all over the place. Okay, negotiate the bank. We did that. What else? Okay, so you have a house, you find it, it needs 10000 in rehab. We're out Okay, why? So, 
during the subprime era, I'm just telling you, everybody went brain dead because you could sell houses just like this, right? All the fraud that was going on was amazing. I had one lady walk into our title office over about 60 days claiming she was buying three homesteads. She couldn't afford the first $300,000 house. We knew what was going on. We saw the application. We closed deal one. Deal two came in. Three weeks later, she's doing the same thing again with a, a different lender. We notified the lender. Guys, she just bought a homestead three weeks ago. Did you find another one? Didn't matter. They closed the deal. And they did a third one. But this huge fraud was going on back in this time frame. And investors forgot the basic strategies. They got greedy. So she could buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. But when the music stops, it was like, oh my gosh, what do you do? I mean, I was getting phone calls nonstop from the investor and real community because they didn't know what to do on what was selling houses. And, and Lord, I didn't either. I'm trying to figure this out still. But the answer was the recreation of owner finance, at least for me during this point in time. Because when sellers can't sell and buyers can't buy, God, it's time to do the bank. One of my philosophies is, is do what those do who control all the money for the bank. What banks do, they finance. And this was truly the, the, the solution for this time because buyers could not get a mortgage loan to save their life. They still wanted to own a house. I needed a solution to get out and get cash flow and income production. If I think 10000 in rehab into the house, I need to find a way to re replace that 10000 which was visa be a down payment. And this allowed me to go back to my banks and restructure the transaction. And this is literally what saved my hide from, from bankruptcy, I believe. And again, having done this, y'all, having gone to my banks and sat down with them and said, I'm not sure what's happening, but here's how we're going to handle this. Having that report them over in a history over time allowed me to put the deal together and structure it, but it allowed me to sell my homes for 100% plus of value. So instead of going through the investor marketplace at 40 and just getting slaughtered, we were able to get full value, down payments, and move them there. So, quick question What's the house worth, y'all? Good answer. So, that's what we, we went through and did in this regard. Uh, the bankers loved it, allowed us to empire the loan, and guys, it didn't happen overnight. It took me about eight to nine years, but we paid off all of the old debt. When you have $50 million of, of, of debt outstanding at that time, some of it did cash out, but you have to get it amortized. We were able to do it. And it wasn't easy. But you have to be willing to put the effort forth. And I don't care whether it's one house, 10 houses, or hundreds of houses. You have to be willing to do that in our business. If you're not, you may want to find something else to do. Along the way, you have to learn to eat. We all want to eat, right? And so as we structured this, we're not making any income. Where's all the income from property selling? It's going to the bank to pay off the debt, right? You're not making any money. And so what I did was, and I didn't know I was doing this until in hindsight, but I created the IMAP system, which is simply the disclosures utilized for the owner finance world. And I pushed that out into the Texas marketplace. And what it did for me, it allowed me to create that secondary source of income through my law offices and whatnot. <clears throat> so again, don't quit the day job. Having cash flow coming in, from some format, or finding a way to create multiple streams of income so that if one slows down or stops or dries up, you have income coming to other places that will help you support and substantiate that. Too many investors get into this business without that thought process. They quit their job or they're a full-time investor. Guys, you don't have to do that. There are many ways of making this business work without going through those things. And for me, you know, this, I'll be honest, when you are going through this, you don't sleep a lot. You're trying to find solutions. Yeah. You're up at 2 o'clock in the morning sitting in front of the computer, putting all this together in some format. And then you go to seminars on how to teach people how to do it because you have to be retrained because I forgot about it. But it helped me get through it. It's kind of my, uh, my medicine a little bit to go through there. But it did. Not only did it help me, it helped investors, other home buyers and home sellers in the communities. So just taking a moment and looking back on all of this. One of the first things that, you know, I had to think about is when you go through troubles, and guys, you are going to go through troubles in our business. 
You know, you always hope not, but it's going to happen during the business long enough. You better have a positive attitude. If you've got a bad attitude, you're down on yourself, you're depressed, what's going to happen? You're gone, right? You have to be able to focus going forward. My focus was the creation of the seller finance modeling and pushing that out while we're handling everything else. But it gave me something to focus on that came positive. And it's hard. But as you do that, you know, be thinking about this, guys. Don't wait until it hits you in the face. Because when the crash hit in 08, as I said earlier, we were rocking and rolling. It was good times. And then, wham, and you're not expecting it. I don't have the crystal ball. And all of us investors think, think it's never going to quit. So start planning for those things today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Anticipate. Along the way, as I said earlier, develop your exit strategies. Be thinking about them. What do I do if this? Learn how to create multiple exit strategies to cover your rear end. The positive relationship. I cannot, again, tell you how much this is important this is. With your bankers. Don't just make it a business relationship. Try to get in, love who you are, how you do things. Perform. If you want to be, you make money in business, guys, long term. You don't do it short term. At least I've never learned how to do it short term, unfortunately. And as such, you have to have that with your bankers and the community around you. If you're jacking other investors around, doing the wrong thing, when times come, are they going to help you? No. Learn to generate cash flow. We had it that helped us maintain. It, I didn't get a chance to spend a lot of money in those days because it's all going somewhere else. Today, I get that opportunity because I did it in those instances. Put the money away. Have savings. I don't know what the percentage is out there of people that have they live paycheck to paycheck. It's huge in the regard. If you're going to be in the real estate investment business, do this because if you are in business and you lose a house before a closing for your banks or whatever it might be, you're probably out of business because the next bank, they aren't going to lend you money. They're going to have to wind up going to the private capital world only, and they may not lend you money either. Always expect the best. We're all, you know, uh, eternal optimists in that regard. But, guys, you have to be prepared for the worst to happen and be thinking through these things. Bottom line, my position is keep investing. I don't know of anything else better to do. You know, I could have been an engineer. I love engineering. It's have been great. I'm a lawyer. I'm a title guy. My real passion is investing. It's fun. This business can be a lot of fun, whether it's buying, flipping, whatever it might be, learning the strategies. But this, this is the fun part of business. And I can think today in my career, as I look back, of absolutely nothing I would rather do. So we do a lot of things. This is a little bit about who we are and what we do in our businesses. And as you all notice, I have multiple things of income that come in because we have an ebb and flow in the marketplace that goes constantly. And guys, things are going to come back around. Real estate on a 20-year cycle. Does everybody know that? Things it's historically proven that way. We're not going to go through another housing crash like we did back in 08, 09 because they put some things in place and restructured it. What the next thing that creates it or the downturns, I don't know. You know, Nick was talking about how the stock market reacts every nine or nine or ten years, whatever it was. It's just, it's, it's life. It's business. Expect and anticipate these kind of things. But set yourself up to be reasonable. And when you can create multiple streams of income, whatever that might be, you don't have to go out and buy hundreds of houses a year. You know, you can keep your day job and buy one house a year for 10 years. And if you understand how to finance things properly, in my world, to sell finance, and how to pay off your debt over that time frame, you can have 10 houses debt-free in about 12 years. $100,000 houses is going to generate, you know, $1,000 a month positive cash flow for you. If you do two houses a year, in 12 years or so, you can generate $20,000 a month of positive cash flow. Would everybody like that? We all do. But again, too many investors want to jump in head first and they don't think long term. The whole approach is very myopic in that regard. So guys, think through this stuff. I don't care how big you're or whatnot, things happen. It happened to us. We live through it. You have to have a plan of attack. You have to be able to do it the right way. Always do the right thing. 
and build the relationships you need to build out there, and it'll keep you safe in bad times.